QUT acknowledges the First Nations owners of the lands on where we gather today and pay our respects to the elders, laws, customs and creation spirits of this country. For thousands of years, the First Nations owners have gathered to share their knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and acknowledge the important role they play within our communities. We recognise their long and continuing connection to country, the lands, winds and waters throughout Australia. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, researching and learning. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 10th and final educator webinar for 2021. It's lovely to have you here with us today. And uh, we are um, hosting today's webinar from QUT in Brisbane or Mianjin, uh, which is the traditional country of the Turrbal and Yagara peoples. And we pay our respects to them today and um, acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and extend that same respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today on the webinar or viewing recordings. We want to give you a, ch a chance to um, put your acknowledgement um, for, for traditional country uh, in the chat today. So if you wanted to just introduce yourself and acknowledge the um, traditional people um, in the chat, that would be great. So today's video, we are going to um, have a little bit of a look back at the year that was in our webinar series, and I think we'll just get started. I'm going to hand it over to Kylie. Beautiful. I think a lot of this was inspired a bit by some of your comments, Jess, when you presented last time, really around some of the, um, the learnings that you had experienced, and that was great to hear. So I guess we, we've taken the opportunity to really reflect back and when we looked at the aim of the our PCC View project, it's really not just to provide the free teaching and learning resources, which are fantastic, but we also um, are going to try and, or what we have aim to do is to build confidence in the capabilities in educators who are actually delivering this palliative care education. And we've always offered one-to-one -one support for educators to implement the PCC for You resources. But this year, we really wanted to broaden our reach and we acknowledge that educators are time poor and there's so many more challenges that you're experiencing at the moment. Um, so we wanted to be able to deliver something that was online and that also we were able to have the resource then available on demand. So that's in, in the way that we've done this with the webinars being recorded. So the aim of this webinar series was really to pro provide information about the evidence-based learning and teaching resources and then look at how these strategies can be used in palliative care and how the pcc for resources can also be used um, to apply these strategies and develop the palliative care capabilities. So that's just a bit of an overview summary there. And I think we really have achieved that. When we look back on what we've done in 2021, you know, we've run, this is this will be our 10th session. We've had 19 guest presenters. Um, we've had 244 educators zooming in from all over Australia and a number of different disciplines that have been represented. And from the different areas, universities, registered training organisations and health services as well. And we have had um, our webinars recordings being reviewed, 683 views to, as of today of all of our webinar um, recordings and resources. So that's, I think that's fantastic and demonstrates that we have actually um, extended our reach and that was really our aim for this year. That's good. Yeah. And if you wanted to catch up on any sessions that you've missed, you can either access them through the learning management system on the Educator Community Hub and they're also available just on our YouTube channel. So there's a playlist called PCC for You Educator Webinars 2021. So you can catch up on any that you might have missed. Uh, we are also in the process of trying to gather some feedback from our educators on their experience with the webinars. And we've just put together a short feedback form. Um, hopefully, it will take no more than three to five minutes to complete. 
Um, so Kylie's just going to put the link to that in the chat box, which um, you can complete. You can click on that link and complete at any time. Or you, if you wanted to use a, um, a different device, you can scan yeah, the QR code and, and do that right now. Um, we'll have the form um, open for feedback for another week or so. So um, you don't, don't feel like you need to do it right away. So we're going to have a look back, as we said, at our educator webinars for 2021. Um, and we just wanted to recap um, what we've looked at and perhaps some of the key learnings. So um, we're just going to start with webinar one. This one focused on um, ways to help learners and educators become more comfortable talking about dying and death and some strategies that people use to encourage self-reflection and sharing. Yeah, so there were some icebreaker activities that we used to ease attendees into the webinars. This was new for us and that is new for webinar attendees. So we use some of those activities and I'll show you the whiteboard activity that we used in a moment. We also acknowledged the sensitive and triggering nature of some of this content. We had educators telling us that they had students sobbing in an online setting, and that was obviously very challenging to deliver that education. So really acknowledging that there needs to be careful consideration of supports. And we also had though, on the other hand, a couple of speakers that shared that online presentation of this content actually may suit some mm. students in terms of the front face-to-face -face being very confronting. So being online sort of offered that protective factor of anonymity and a safe place to participate. So that was, that was quite interesting to, um, to hear. So this is just an example now of the one of the icebreaker activities, and this is where they had to, users had to identify all the other euphemisms that are used um, to, to talk about death and dying. As you can see, there's a number of um, comments there. Mm -hmm. And also we, we tried to model the use of technology. So using the whiteboard function to explore concepts and to promote interactions with users, which I think works quite well. And this one, we had a, quite a few participants on this webinar, so you can see that there's some um, responses over the top of other responses. We weren't quite fast enough with clearing them away a little bit. Um, in this webinar, we also heard from Dr. Anna Hatton, um, who uses PCC for you resources in the physiotherapy program at UQ over a number of years. And you had some reflections on Anna's presentation. Yeah, this is certainly one of my, um, she, this was a great presentation. I think some of the key learnings was really knowing your students and shaping that education. She presented data showing the students were, were really young and a third were international and half had spent no time at all with older people. So she described scaffolding the inclusion of palliative care with theoretical concepts to start built on that with um, practical learning opportunities and then leading to a interprofessional multidisciplinary, oh, sorry, multidisciplinary team discussion panel that brought everything together. And in 2020, when this was delivered online because of obviously COVID, um, Anna commented that the online Q&A with students was actually more, was re re mm -hmm. reflected deeper and more complex reflection by the students on communication, grief and loss and self-care more than previous years when it was done face to face. So that was quite significant. Yeah. And I think um, in relation to the sensitive nature of the content, Anna certainly did acknowledge that. And I loved her statement. She said that it's a good reminder that some students are in the process of developing resilience emotional maturity and learning self-care strategies. So there is every chance that emotions could be raised when discussing these sensitive topics, which I thought was a really nice, gentle approach. Mm -hmm. and, and in response, she was quite proactive in providing student support. Um, she provided twice weekly check-ins with the students. She gave warning through emails of potentially triggering content before classes and also um, notification of any of the university supports as well and, and generally made herself available as well. So I think, she, yeah, that was a great example. Yeah, yeah. So webinar two, we looked at teaching the principles of palliative care and we took an opportunity to highlight um, the PCC for you essential learning outcomes and the learning resources which can be used to develop healthcare students' capabilities in palliative care. We revisited the principles for including palliative care in undergraduate curricula. 
and we heard from two educators about how they incorporated the principles of palliative care into their undergraduate curriculum. So this one was fun. We, we showed the video of the closed line um, method of curriculum design. And then we had webinar participants um, in breakout rooms and they had an opportunity to then apply that methodology to develop a curriculum against one of the graduate capability mm -hmm. and learning outcomes. And you can see here some of the brainstorming that was undertaken in that breakout room, looking at developing capability of describe, um, describing the core principles of palliative care. So that was quite, mm -hmm. quite a good practical session. Yeah, and I think people got some good ideas out of that for. Um for moving forward in their curriculum. Mm. We then had um, perspectives of two different academics in relation to applying the principles of palliative care, one with quite an established program using PCC for You, and one with the opportunity to develop a brand new elective in palliative care. And I, I liked this um, quote by John in that I see inclusion of principles of palliative care as fundamental to laying the foundation for application of practice across the lifespan and across multiple settings. And I think that really goes to the crux of why it is it's such an essential mm. element to put into undergraduate education. So, yeah. yeah. Webinar three. Yes, in this webinar, we shifted our attention to the vet sector educators. And uh, I began by reflecting on some of the contemporary challenges and the sector influences on the health workforce and the role of palliative care in education to meet the health needs required. And we also gave an opportunity to educators to actually, from the vet sector, to talk about mm -hmm. some of the challenges they were having. We used Padlet for that and then provide an overview of um, the EN toolkits that are, we have on offer. So next slide. So whilst this webinar was informational with relation to the updates to the EN toolkit, we also provided an opportunity for the teachers to explore some of the challenges and we used a Padlet um, approach with that um, and then had some opportunities with the team to discuss opportunities to overcome these. So that was quite helpful and good networking as well out of that. And I think also one of the highlights was Karen's presentation looking at um, the EN toolkit implementation at Chisholm University, Chisholm College. Um, it was, it's very comprehensively embedded over mm. there with face-to-face -face and self-directed learning. Um, and the capstone session really in session eight involves simulation, the use of a patient, patient actors to explore end of life concepts. And it was, it was quite good to hear that example and shows how the resources mm. can be used flexibly yeah. in different environments. Very good. Me again. Um, so this webinar, webinar four, really built on the recognition that interprofessional practice is integral to quality palliative care and successful interprofessional practice really has to be promoted through opportunities for IPL in undergraduate education. So we highlighted um, an activity that we worked with Griffith University on where it was a simulation based interprofessional learning activity and also the newly released um, pcc for you mm -hmm. IPL case scenario, which had just been released um, earlier this year. And interesting, one of the reflections that Nathan um, Reeves from Griffith University made was around pivoting to the online simulation in 2020 and noting that it's continued to meet its student um, outcomes and compared with the face-to-face -face de delivery has actually been more economically viable. So I think mm. more and more, although it was a tough year, we've, we've heard this story over and over again that there are some sort of silver linings to yeah. the online delivery of um, education. Yeah. yeah. Uh, webinar five, we looked at the Care Worker Toolkit, which I think has just celebrated its first birthday. Mm. It's been out and about for um, over a year now. And um, we heard from, um, uh, this was one of our um, consumer reviewers for the Care Worker Toolkit, Genevieve Cook, who was um, previously a care worker and then an enrolled nurse and at the time was a registered nurse uh, student. And she had a, a look through the toolkit um, as part of our review process and um, she had some really good impressions of the, of the toolkit in terms of the way that it's presented and the way it flows. Uh, and she highlighted that for herself was a really good revision on self-care 
um, and about the holistic nature of palliative care and caring not just for the person with life-limiting illness, but for their family and community as well. So that then brings, brought us to webinar six, where we had a collaborative approach with our IPEPA colleague, uh, National Project Manager, Nicole Hewlett. Um, we spoke a little bit about what culturally responsive care is and how our current focus topic two is being redeveloped. And then we had really just a lovely open conversation with Nick um, and the people who attended the webinar were able to ask questions and um, we asked Nicole some um, particular questions around delivering culturally responsive palliative care. We talked about the diversity of peoples. Um, we talked about some of the beliefs around the end of life journey and some of the common barriers that people experience when it comes to accessing palliative care. And uh, we also heard from Nicole just the importance of um, developing in entry to practice healthcare students, that ability to really engage and listen deeply to somebody's story. We have uh, taken some shorter videos out of that webinar, uh, which we're using in our redeveloped toolkit. So they're also available on our YouTube um, channel under our PCC for you IPEP yarning playlist. Um, we had some, some key questions from academics around the role of non-Indigenous educators in delivering this kind of content. And um, many people feel uncomfortable about that. And Nicole addressed this quite candidly. This was one of our favourite parts of the mm. webinar. Um, she said, the fact that you're not Indigenous is not a good enough excuse to avoid teaching this content. We're only 3% of the population, so there will not be enough Indigenous healthcare educators to teach the content. Sharing your own journey as an educator and what you have learned and inviting any Indigenous people in the room to share their knowledge if they'd like to is important. So it was kind of a takeaway message for us to keep keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, <laughs> so, I think so. Yeah. And a bit of inspiration. I think we'll possibly start the year next year with some, um, mm. some motivational a webinar to sort of really encourage educators to deliver this content. Yes, yes, that's right. We're already planning webinar. <laughs> webinars for 2022. <laughs> webinar seven, we had a look at simulation. We did another really, you know, breakout teaching and learning strategy that um, has increased in focus this year. And I provided an overview of simulation, what it is as a learning strategy, how it impacts on student learning and, and its role in palliative care education. So we actually had a couple speakers. We had um, Linda, who's part of the pcc for You team, talked about um, the use of the pcc for You case scenarios in the nursing program at QUT, and they use patient actors in the simulation. And some of the re student reflections on the screen um, just show how much they got out of the experience. And I think it was quite a successful um, mm. implementation process. That was good. We also had the wonderful um, Dr. Naomi Chatisi, and she discussed her work on simulation. I, I just love this quote that she, um, it just resonated with me. So simulation is not a blunt instrument. It is nuanced and you need to find the best fit. There are a range of typologies. It is about thinking intentionally at the design stage. What am I trying to achieve? What simulation type is the best? I think, and, and she described how her research um, is highlighting that learning outcome, learning comes not only from the interaction that the student has with the simulated patient, but really that reflective debrief um, and being able to sit and process the emotions which may raise during the activity and, and really, again, highlighted the critical role that educators have in modelling that communication and those reflective processes as well. And this, this slide just really highlights sort of an outcome of that paper that she had, which is the key strategies um, that educators can use. And she also raised the issue of um, reflective fatigue. That mm -hmm. was also part of the conversation. Um, peer learning was also highlighted as a, as a really rich opportunity. So I'd certainly recommend this as one of the webinars to watch if you missed it because mm. um, it really did drill down to some of that pedagogy around critical thinking um, and analysis and reflection. And reflection. Yeah. yeah. 
and honestly, just to listen to somebody oh, who's she's very passionate. passionately <laughs> into her content area is <laughs> it's just inspiring, I think. Mm -hmm. On to webinar eight, where we introduced people to the PACE directory app, which is our um, something that as a collaborative we've been have been working on over the, the year. And um, we were giving a bit of a background to the app and, and its development. Um, helping people understand how to use it. And then we also were privileged to hear from a number of our um, project partners who have resources on the app. Um, so you can see all the logos there on the screen. We heard from um, just a short amount from each of these people, um, just highlighting the resources that they have and um, how they have found them, how you can find them on the app. Uh, webinar nine. Yeah. This is great. So our last, our most recent um, webinar. So DG Morgan really set the scene and looked at the, the role of allied health in palliative care is no longer emerging. Um, it is integral and reinforced by a recent WHO report on allied health in palliative care. So that was great to have Deidre um, come and set that scene. Um, Jennifer Ong at the University of Sydney has undertaken a survey of baseline student outcomes with her current curriculum um, in, palliative, in pharmacy. And with the aim of now reviewing the outcomes of that survey mm -hmm. and reinforcing then in 2022, a, the palliative care content in a new curriculum and reevaluating. So that was really exciting and gave some context around um, pharmacy and palliative care. Um, always great to hear from Bernie. She described innovative use of um, VoiceThread platform um, to use the PCC for you learning activities and case scenarios. And she's really had found again, much more student interaction and engagement than in her original face-to-face -face tutorials. So mm -hmm. that was a really good reflection. And again, looking at the role of physiotherapy. And then we had Jess and Helen who had quite different um, subject areas. So Jess in aged care, Helen looking at neuro, um, but still really looking at the, their role and contribution in palliative care and using elements of PCC to mm -hmm. um, resources to support teaching. So that was um, fantastic panel discussion. Yeah, it was, it was great to see um, people just, and as allied health professionals are so good at doing, working together well and delivering a really um, engaging session. And I have to um, clarify that the, the images on the screen, they're actually <laughs> taken mid-sentence for many of them, um, and just to show you how invested they were in, in the conversation. So yeah, we really appreciated that. And that brings us to the end of our webinar sessions for the year. We've just sort of put them all together there on the screen. little bit of time looking at some of the learning and teaching strategies um, that we have used in our webinars. Um, we've heard from some of you that they're helpful in working with your students um, in terms of doing online or blended learning. So we thought we'd give you a bit of background information on them today. Um, while we're going through, have a think about some of the strategies that you've used to encourage active learning and we'll ask um, to hear your ideas when we get to the end. So firstly, um, our webinars really are, in terms of a learning and teaching approach, we wanted to in, um, use those principles of adult learning where we know that as adults, we want our learning to be relevant and real life and interesting and fun and connected to what we already know. We wanted to use um, active learning strategies that involve people in the learning experience. Uh, we know that uh, people's attention span um, in a face-to-face, -face, um, in-person setting is usually around 10 to 15 minutes, and that's much less online, so around 5 to 10 minutes. So keeping people active and engaged in the learning process is um, something that we want to try and do, and we have intent, that's been our intention with these webinars. Um, we have actually heard from people that um, they didn't like it because they couldn't just tune into the webinar and then sit and eat their lunch or answer their emails that they were actually being asked to do things, which <laughs> was different. So we, we think that's different in a good way. So um, we also wanted to try and bring in some collaborative learning um, to, I guess, encourage networking and engagement with other educators who are working in this space. Um, collaborative learning kind of is based on the idea that learning is naturally a social act and that um, it, learning occurs when we actively engage with other people. 
And then we also needed to be aware of that idea of having safety in learning, that palliative care content can be personal and emotive for educators as well as for students. So we wanted to try and um, build some trust between people and groups, especially when we were looking at difficult um, topics. So these are the key things that we have uh, learned and used over the course of our webinar series. So we try to make introductions meaningful. Um, as Kylie mentioned back in our first session, we did a couple of icebreaker activities and um, these are just some of the other ones that we, we use. Um, people who attended some webinar sessions in the middle, we added, added a few curly questions into the polls um, to ask, you know, just to, to kind of break the ice a little bit. Um, would you rather die in a huge vat of wine or a huge vat of molten chocolate? And we got some interesting, uh, interesting data on that. Uh, we wanted to also provide people with a variety of ways to engage. So we have our um, re reactions that you can use in your video conferencing platform of um, ticks or crosses, thumbs up, clapping, all of those kinds of um, interactions. You can raise your hand as well. Uh, we use the chat quite a bit um, and then we also used um, polls to just gauge people's experience or interest with with certain things uh, we've got demonstrations there of just the zoom platform but they all of those things are available in other video conferencing platforms as well we also wanted to um, use things that strategies that got people thinking about what they're learning um, we know that if you're thinking about what you're learning, then you're more likely to um, understand it and be able to apply that content as well. So a few different strategies that we used um, in that. One is a was think, pair and share, which you might be familiar with. We would ask a question or a statement for reflection. Um, people think about it by themselves for a minute, then share it with one other person, which you can do in breakout rooms or just using a um, private chat message and then share with the wider group if you're comfortable doing that. Uh, we ask people to write a quiz question, so to think about what they're learning and um, then ask a question that might you know, test the learning of their fellow um, participants. Uh, when we're showing large resources or video content and we wanted people to be looking out for something during the video or while they're exposed to the the um, resource, then we give, set them up a little bit with some key points. So look out for three things you notice about um, how the person is demonstrating active, active listening, for example. Um, that sort of sets people up to be engaged in the resource rather than just passively sitting back and watching it. Um, make a list is another strategy. So as you're going through some content, make a list. So we, we could have said to you at the beginning of our webinars of the year review, make a list of the ones you've been to, the ones that you liked, which ones you're going to go back to. And that would, um, you know, I guess set you up to be active in your learning. So you're taking notes off to the side or something like that. Uh, and another one we have used is making a word cloud. So these are great ideas for just gathering people's um, thoughts and impressions um, about a particular topic you're learning about. And you can use online, various online platforms for word cloud development, or you can just get people to um, use the whiteboard as we sort of showed. It's, it's a fairly crude word cloud, but it still, it works. We also ask people to contribute. Um, and we gave them different options for that. So I guess for simple contributions, we used our whiteboard uh, or our annotate function in Zoom. So um, in this activity on the bottom of the screen there, we asked people to indicate using the stamper tool in, in annotate, whether which of these learning outcomes they thought were important and needed to be covered. Um, and they could also add text to the screen as well. And then for more complex contributions, we use some online tools, as we saw in the review um, of Padlet and Jam Google Jamboard is another one. Um, so these tools are available um, for use and you just provide a link in the chat and then people can access the, the boards outside of the video conferencing platform. Uh, we, do, we realized some of our learning from this is that whatever we're using, we make sure we give detailed instructions on how to um, find it and then give people time. So 
the temptation is to rush on and start the activity, but not everyone may have found the, the resource yet. So we've learned that we just give people a bit of time. Um, uh, we added in links to the chat so make it easier for people to follow and add our instructions into the chat as well. And we're trying to be mindful of people that aren't using two screens or maybe viewing the webinar on their tablet or phone. So we're trying to give options for people. <clears throat> um, we also tried to encourage networking and collaboration using breakout rooms. And the same learnings, I guess, go with that, that we, we realise that the smaller the number of people in the room, the better to some extent, uh, as they would all get a chance to contribute. Um, we realised three to five members were typically the best. And again, making sure instructions are clear and allowing enough time. I think we had a few breakout rooms early on where there was people frustrated because they only just got time to meet and greet each other and didn't get to do the activity. So we learned from that and then gave a bit more time. I guess one of our, um, our main problems with running these webinars has been we try to put a lot into an hour and we often have to have to scale it back a little bit. Um, also having a team member or somebody who you know knows the content in each of the breakout rooms was really helpful. So in terms of our lessons learned over the year, um, these are the things we, we try and do with our webinars now. We make and plan, plan and make a timeline for each session uh, and we try and follow it. <laughs> uh, we provide further reading and resources afterwards to support the content delivery, so not trying to deliver it all in, in the session. Um, we give multiple options for people to participate we practice beforehand, even though it may not always seem like we do, we do practice. Um, we have a second technical person who can be available if anyone has difficulties um, and can also do the playing videos, sharing screens, that kind of thing. Um, we try and be flexible about the time and activities. And sometimes we're being flexible in the middle of the webinar, um, you know, doing one thing or not doing something if we run out of time for it. We try and always bring it back at the end and summarise our key messages and always keep learning about our platform. I think we've found each time we've run a webinar that Zoom has done an update Every and we have update. to relearn it's yeah. a new um, particularity of Zoom. Um, so, yeah, we're always learning and trying sort of different things to, to make it work more effectively. So why do we do this? Um, and this is a quote that I just like, I appreciate because I think this gives me a why to do it this way. Um, Benjamin Franklin said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. 